Uh, thank you very much to the uh, social psychology section of the BPS for this um, fantastic honour. I am uh, truly honoured and um, delighted to be here today. Can I just check before I proceed that my sound and everything is okay? Is that all? I'm going to, okay, I'm going to assume everything is working well, uh, unless somebody waves at me. So, uh, yes, thank you again. So I will um, just share my screen uh, to introduce my um, talk. And uh, it is, um, as Shelley said, uh, based on my new book, which is actually just out called Parenting for a Digital Future. And uh, I see the work on parenting as really complementing my long-term interest in uh, families in a digital age. Uh, where I try to take social psychological insights, if you like, into um, the very um, multidisciplinary world of uh, research on media and communications and uh, our changing digital lives. And this work was um, made possible by a grant from the um, MacArthur Foundation, which is an educational foundation in the um, US, as part of the Connected Learning Research Network on digital media and learning. And in that um, in that really fantastic research network, I first of all worked on uh, children's experiences of lives in the digital age and then, um, as I'll explain, I wanted to then focus on, on the role of parents who, I shall argue, are often a, a neglected group um, or consulted primarily in relation to what they do uh, as, as a way of accessing their children, as it were, as a way of learning about their children. But I wanted to understand parents uh, in their own right. So this seems to be, um, I think, a very appropriate time for thinking about how people's lived struggles with technology um, are related to the wider societal problems that we're all facing. Uh, as we know, um, before lockdown, when I, I did my research and actually when I was um, uh, first told I will be doing this lecture, uh, children went to school and they saw their friends outside the home and parents were worried about screen time and online risk. But essentially, the digital future was still the stuff of science fiction. And under COVID-19, what we've seen is technology has become the way in which children habitually interact with the world, uh, families interact with the world, um, relating to each other, doing schoolwork and work, connecting with friends. So much of the infrastructure of childhood and family life education, social services, entertainment, civic, cultural institutions, they've all moved online. And what once seemed to be kind of optional, how do we relate to di the digital, has become, uh, our lives have become digital by default. So while the, the book was written just before COVID, I hope that the messages are um, perhaps even more uh, um, meaningful today. So the idea for the book began by recognising what I see as an impossible task for parents. They are faced with their children today and they have to bring them up for a world in 2030 or 2040. Um, but what will that be like? And I think they ask themselves often, how, how can they prepare their children for that future world? So that's actually the question that Alicia Blumros and I um, asked all the parents we interviewed for our book. We asked them to look back at their childhood and then forward to their children's adulthood as a kind of way into understanding their parenting and um, the way in which they position themselves within, within the social world and within the kind of biography of their, of their lives. So I'll start with an example. In one family, Mia Ely, who was only eight, was already a digital leader at school, and she was excited about learning something special at Bloomberg, Bluebell Primary School's Code Club. Her mothers, Rachel and Erin, were really determined that Mia's gender would not channel her down what they called a kind of bystander route to the future. They wanted her to be the person who instigates the action, the maker, the doer in her life. So Rachel worked part time as an artist and, uh, and as a gardener, which is a creative but hardly lucrative um, combination. And that left her with a lot of time to volunteer at the school and keep an eye on what she called Mia's portfolio of opportunities. So like many of the parents Alicia and I interviewed, Rachel saw the digital as promising her daughter the in opportunity for individual self-realization that she too was embracing in forging new practices of family, class and gender. 
And she was especially excited that Mia has opportunities now that she did not experience herself. So she had wanted to do woodworking as a child, but was denied because of her gender. So now Mia can do coding. And that seemed to her um, a real uh, improvement. But when we followed up, Rachel had rather little to say about what those digital opportunities or that digital future would be like. And in that, she was typical of the parents that we interviewed. So digital technologies were really focal in many visions of the future for good and for ill. But parents struggle to make sense of exactly what that might mean for their children. Rachel used her own experience as the point of comparison, and that was um, commonplace, um, and was confident that the digital opportunities would make a positive difference in Mia's future. But she did that by looking back, as it were. So the past is tangible, and the future for many parents remains an abstraction and is really hard to predict. Daya Thaka, a low income single mother of four, echoed that is kind of vague and hopeful views of many when she said, um, I don't know, I imagine them, to, I just, just want them to be happy and independent and successful. Yet Daya imagined the future for her children unfolding in circumstances that were much more difficult than she remembered for her, from her own childhood, having grown up in a tight knit Bengali community. Today, she said, again, speaking, I think for many parents, it's society, the fear. When I was growing up, everybody knew each other and now hardly anybody knows each other. They've got closed lives now. So this sense of loss of social support and social connection was echoed by lots of the parents that we interviewed. And it was especially strong among the parents who had children with special educational needs and disabilities. And for them, our questions about the future were almost unthinkable. Ali Kada, father of Sana, a 16 year old on the autism spectrum said, I don't think about it really for the future because otherwise I just get mad. I better take it step by step. So imagining the future is simultaneously necessary and impossible for parents. It's necessary because their everyday mundane activities are constantly weighed for their potential to realize parents' hopes and fears, hopes and fears for their child decades into the future. If part of the experience of being a parent is to want the child to be and do certain things, then being able to imagine those things and realize them in practice is really crucial. But imagining the future is also impossible for parents, not only because the future cannot be predicted, especially for those facing difficulties, but because of the clamor of future predictions in the public sphere from politicians, experts, media gurus, marketers, science fiction writers, all of those visions are contested and contradictory. Using the term future talk, Meryl Alper analyzes the dialogic processes through which societal and political discussions of the future and of technology are constitutive of our personal intimate narratives within the family. So when we asked Lena Huben what her children would need to be prepared for the future, she articulated a science fiction vision of which she was simultaneously anxious and critical saying, it's perfectly obvious to me, we're headed for a kind of virtual robotic cyborg future. That's what she imagines for her child. Lena's imagined future and her future talk shapes her present parenting in distinctly resistant ways. So she then launched into an impassioned account of teaching her children to cook and to understand where their food came from. Not so much so that they could produce a meal, but as she put it, to encourage the handling of physical things as much as possible, to prepare them for the virtual world by making sure they had a concrete world before. But her resistance only went so far because she sought balance, something that we analyze in the book. So her daughter Miriam was learning to write poetry and Lena encouraged her to blog about this, even though that led to a series of further difficulties. So this act of balancing is linked to an ambivalence about the meaning of now, the present moment between the parents' remembered past childhood and the adulthood they imagined for their child. Now is sometimes judged negatively against the nostalgic golden age, or optimistically, an anticipation of a better future against which progress can be measured. 
as for Rachel. Blogger mother Melissa Bell was torn between looking backwards and looking forwards. Looking back, she said, I want my children to have a famous five upbringing, you know, running around in the garden. And this was a really um, often expressed vision. But looking forward, she said, technology is the way forward. And jobs wise, you know, it'll give them a head start. And I just think it'll become the norm. So many parents are kind of mourning that past childhood of fresh air and creative play and muddy knees, which offers such an evocative counterpoint to a science fiction future. But they're also very pragmatic. They think if technology is the future, let's get on with it. So they're trying to undertake a very difficult balancing act, and they do so with this ambivalent mixture of resistance and embrace, both to technology and to the competitive culture of individualism, within which ideas about technology are often embedded. We reflected on whether we heard these discussions more often among middle-class mothers, the ones who the media loved to dub the helicopter parents, the tiger mums, wrapping their children in cotton wool, using technology as a digital tether, or on the contrary, trying to inoculate their children against danger through free range parenting philosophies. But as part of our research, we did a national survey to accompany the qualitative fieldwork I've been um, introducing you to, and we found that really most parents were in this state of ambivalence. So they agreed both that it's really important for their child's future, that they can use technology, and at the same time, they think society should be really concerned about what technology is doing to our lives. Scholars of contemporary family life describe the rising anxiety and intensified logics by which parents are trying to bring up their children under conditions of risk. In parallel with worries about family life, there are these warnings about uh, technology, yes, and also about a crisis in childhood. In our risk society, in our individualized culture, welfare safety nets are being rolled back or privatized, People are tasked with making all kinds of decisions under radical uncertainty and in the face of contradictory expert advice. So it's this co contemporary constellation of real and perceived threats that Ulrich Beck has termed the risk society, in which by contrast with the natural threats of um, uh, hurricanes or, or tornadoes, risk he defines as the systematic way of dealing with the hazards and insecurities induced and introduced by modernization itself. As Beck and Beck Gunshine observe, this burden is on all of us to calculate and face those unequal costs and difficult outcomes. And it's not an accidental consequence of socioeconomic changes. It's also a matter of political ideology, which they call institutionalized individualism which I think is a kind of helpful way of thinking about the competitive sink or swim culture in which social support is contracting because it plans on, it precisely plans on increasing individual responsibility. So in the face of all these risks, all the social changes that they're living through, parents are increasingly responsibilized, to use a horrible term, for their actions and for the consequences that flow from them. And that all adds to the anxiety. The media love to position technology as both the cause and the solution for these anxieties. And to many parents, this seems convincing. So we found that technology enters into parents' strategies of dealing with the wider crises and uncertainties of family life by affording ways to carefully manage, balance and calibrate their everyday lives. Technology also introduces new kinds of visibility, including for parenting. So another theme that ran through our fieldwork was the sense that parenting today is on show and is being constantly judged. So, that, for example, there's a lot of parent shaming that goes on in social media, especially in online parenting groups. No wonder Frank Ferradi talks about modern parenting as paranoid parenting arguing that we've come to think of being at risk as if it's a permanent condition, dissociated from its root causes. So in the Parenting for Digital Future project, we asked ourselves four main questions. 
How are parents bringing up children in the digital age? So what are their practices? What's expected of parents in the digital age or what are the discourses around parenting? What are the hopes and fears crystallized by the idea of the digital future or what are the imagined risks of parenting? And how does parenting relate to the other kinds of socializing agents around the family, especially the school, also the community? In other words, how are parents connected or disconnected from each other? So our research was focused in London and we spent time in a kind of um, ethnographic style project with some 70 families living in the most diverse circumstances we could identify. So we began with a particular bias towards finding families who, as it were, kind of voted with their feet for the digital world. For example, they'd put their children in digital media clubs or video editing clubs or their children had chosen um, some digital interests. Um, and we also interviewed parents who were kind of voting for their feet for the digital, including um, interviewing parent bloggers or parents who thought of themselves as geeks. And actually, we have a chapter in the book about the geek families, um, as they themselves uh, sometimes describe themselves, um, who, for example, um, would describe coding as the new Latin. Um, they hope that geeks will inherit the earth. So they kind of embraced in a rather um, extreme way sometimes um, the technology as a strategy for dealing with the uncertainties and challenges that they face. But most of our families were far from extraordinary um, and hugely diverse and having kind of identified families who'd voted with their feet for the digital, we then tried to kind of balance the sample with um, all kinds of other families. And then as a check on the field work, we did a nationally representative survey of 2000 British parents um, to kind of make sure that the claims we made when we strayed into most parents or few parents that we had um, survey evidence to back that up. One theme that runs through the book um, and which we give a chapter to is the question of class and inequality. And having deliberately tried to sample parents for maximum diversity, we were then struck by the way in which lots of public discussion about parents and parenting kind of homogenizes parents as if they're all the same. And often that discourse, that homogenizing discourse is very classed somehow with the idea of parenting anxiety seen as a exclusively middle class preoccupation, for example. Our research definitely challenged the idea that only the middle classes are worried about parenting or even digital parenting. Um, and also challenged the idea that these um, anxieties are somehow unfounded, invented. Uh, so we sought to demonstrate and explore the, the diversity of ways in which parents are, according to their circumstances, striving for involvement and vigilance within the family and trying to kind of shape the present moment to optimise their child's future in a risk society. Of course, importantly, we saw lots of ways in which economic and cultural capital helps the middle class parents face these challenges more effectively leaving the poorer parents and the less educated ones to struggle under that individualized burden of risk, which um, Orit Beck talked about. Yet many of the poorer and less educated parents were also investing in technology of all kinds in ways that were hopeful and effortful, even if not always um, successful or supported by um, their child's community or school. So even among the relatively underprivileged parents, we saw an open mindedness about digital technology um, and a kind of empathetic uh, identification with the experience of being a child, contradicting Annette LaRoe's characterization of their parenting as a matter of, quote, natural growth, by contrast with what she dubbed middle classes um, concerted cultivation of their children. So that meant that many of the parents we, we interviewed wanted to understand what their child was interested in, what would enable them to support their children, and then to search for the resources that would help them. And many of them talked in terms of choice, which we can um, interpret in, in, in a number of ways. 
So Daya Thacker, who I in, mentioned before, had no special digital skills, but she loved the way her daughter was interested in new ways of doing her hair. And together they would sit and explore this on YouTube and experiment. Rachel Ely was not particularly digitally skilled either, but she could see that Mia was getting confidence from being a digital leader at school. And she knew how to ask questions about creativity and learning. So that's what she did. And again, together, they went on this journey that included discussions about coding and gameplay and robotics. Then other parents, especially a number of the migrant parents we interviewed, found technology really important in sustaining the connections they had with family and culture overseas. So even parents who understand little about technology or have few um, uh, resources would often know to ask their child and their child would create the connections um, or together kind of they would go through um, uh, what's been called um, a process of joint media engagement as a kind of family practice. The family would figure out how to engage together with technology and through it, they would do some of the things that they valued in their lives. So we concluded that there's something classed about the very idea that parenting culture and parenting anxieties are only for the middle classes. The middle class parents were um, perhaps more vocal about their anxieties, but all the parents we interviewed in one way or another held themselves responsible for fostering their children's agency and future life chances. And they were struggling to figure out how to make that investment in the context of a very individualized parenting culture in a risk society. So at the same time, we wanted to question some of the more extreme claims about public anxiety. And this is because we also found ways in which families were kind of finding an accommodation with technology, stepping back from some of the kind of crazy claims about anxiety one reads about parents every day in the media. And one way we saw them stepping back from anxiety and finding their own balance was through what we might call a parenting philosophy. So media panics, of course, focus particularly on poor or working class or otherwise disadvantaged parents, favoring a kind of deficit theory of these um, parents as, as failing. So I wanted to tell you about one um, particular parent in, in, in some depth as an illustration of why we and how we sought to counter this deficit theory. So Anna Michaels became a single mother when she was still a teenager. And having grown up in a conservative Christian West Indian family in South London, she both reacted to and reproduced the demands placed on her. So she described herself with some pride as a pushy parent, a 13-year-old Derek and 11-year-old Dion, saying, look, I'm a single young mum and a gay young mum, so I'm under a lot of categories of negativity in society. And although the family struggled for money, she declared she wanted to her children to have the best, but I don't want them to think that the best is owed to them. So Anna worked hard in her everyday life to counter what she, you know, what we can think of as the stereotyping of poor families and single parents and gay parents. And by the way she refused the position allotted to her in society, she illustrated both the promise and the demands of trying to overcome her difficult circumstances. So she met the uncertainties and the tensions of the risk society by focusing on learning and especially by focusing on learning through digital technologies. So Anna fashioned her home as a kind of learning environment. She supported her children's homework by, as she said, buying all the books, setting them quizzes, explicitly referring to herself as the teacher at home, creating a strict daily timetable to enable her children's interests. And as a working mother, she worried that if they didn't attend classes, the kids would be on the streets looking after themselves. And there's a lot of gang violence around here. And she especially worried about her son because for Derek, a black teenage boy in a poor area of London, those risks were very real. So Anna was delighted when he became interested in computers and computer gaming because this kept him safely at home when he wasn't at school. And she was full of stories about how he took apart her old phone because he loves dissecting stuff and wants to know how things work and put her effort into supporting this. 
So Anna faced multiple challenges, but it was within that context that she judged digital, um, digital transformations could contribute to her efforts to encourage her son's geeky experimentation, to try to build a bridge through technology between learning at home and learning at school. And in this regard, she did intuitively what the theory of connected learning advocates. So developed by uh, Mitsuko Ito and colleagues um, with the MacArthur Foundation, um, uh, the argument is that technologies can support learning connections and learning communities, and so bridge um, digital and social divides uh, in creative and productive ways. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I missed a slide there. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this notion about um, balance, because Anna's approach, like many, was one of balance rather than the straightforward embrace of technology. And her enthusiasm for technology was tempered when Dion had what she called a horrible time when she was bullied at school. And as she reflected ruefully after telling us how angry she'd been about that episode, she said, look, you can't change how technology is moving. You have to have the mentality to adapt to it. So she's embracing a culture of reflexive modernity in which alongside the risks of insecurity and inequality, she's looking for the potential for self-definition. And many contemporary social and technological changes open up exactly those hopes namely that technology can enable new possibilities for social mobility, for flexible working, for reimagined lifestyles, for self-chosen values, and that the technology offers new routes by which those goals can be achieved. So Anna's reflections on her life are about kind of carving out a more open um, identity for herself and attempting to do so for her children, and that's what we mean by the idea of a, of a parenting philosophy. And of course, she'd taken on what, what critics might want to call a burden of self-discipline, but in order to avoid what was otherwise rife, which was the policing of herself and her children by society, um, which is already happening both um, literally and metaphorically. Because in the risk society, um, parents are first in line for blaming and shaming, and they're also the first to blame themselves. And that also kind of adds to um, the sense of consequence, um, adds a sense of consequence to everyday parenting actions. Anna Villalobos Villa uh, calls these security strategies, the way in which parents try to assume the responsibility to make things better for their children, um, in spite of the fact that they're trying to deal with huge societal shifts that are undermining their children's security and life chances in ways that are far beyond their control. So this is the, the kind of the, the, the struggle that we had throughout the research and writing the book, that in a way we were talking to parents and asking them about their digital parenting. But at the same time, we were hearing about and learning about the bigger kind of tectonic shifts of our society that they were living through. Globalization, migration, economic insecurity. And, and for parents and for many, I think, technologies become emblematic of both the threat of, to security and the promised route to ensuring it. So why is the digital so salient? Perhaps um, this is where I would like to go next. I'm just going to find, yeah. Why is the digital so um, salient? So we knocked on the front door um, of so many homes and asked to interview the parents and they were keen to talk to us. And I have to say that hasn't always been the case in my um, uh, career. And I think it's because digital technology is so salient and so troubling to parents. And I want to reflect a little on why. Why technology has become um, the, the, the way in which parents deal with um, all the kind of very many uh, challenges they face. So one reason is really mundane. It relates to what uh, Lena Huben uh, brilliantly called the tsunami of digital stuff in the home. And I have to say, as a researcher, this was really salient to me. Um, 
often walking into quite small homes, you have to make sure you don't actually tread on the iPad and trip over the wires because there is this kind of stuff everywhere. And that very volume and diversity of, of, of devices and connections necessitates endless decisions. Um, and so it becomes top of mind. Parents find themselves reflecting almost every minute, how is their child engaging with technology? How should they be engaging with it? And through these decisions, parents are deciding not only about the technology, but also about how their child's spending their time, about the relationships they're forming, about the values that are being um, imbued in them. Another reason that the digital has become so salient uh, is that to meet the many uncertainties and risks that parents face, they're drawn into monitoring the media landscape for news of the latest opportunity or for advice about how to face a problem. And this heightens their awareness of their digital responsibilities because what they find in the media is a dominant culture of speculation which kind of explicitly hails parents calling on them to make sure they've given their child the maximum opportunities to learn, to become a coder, to have the, you know, the fastest broadband and the best learning materials. And at the same time, and contradictorily, they find a culture that tells them off, that tells them they should be limiting their child's engagement with technology, limiting their screen time, controlling everything they do online, policing and kind of managing and monitoring what they do. So society kind of sets parents this very contradictory set of tasks in relation to technology, and it exhorts them through these contradictory tasks with, to, to kind of ensure that they're always parenting well, meeting the standards of quotes, good parenting, and kind of drawing on that, resort, uh, that explosion of resources that are offered, um, uh, um, burgeoning market of self-help, um, books of experts, of apps and tools designed to help parents, um, which they may, but some of them also responsibilize parents and some of them even commodify parenting. Meanwhile, parents told us that they couldn't really look um, back at their own childhood to guide them in relation to managing the technology. And nor could they really turn to their own parents. So when they got stuck about what to do about food or sleep or homework, you know, they could look back at how they were parented or they could ask their parents. Um, but when it comes to technology, everything is so new and changing so fast that nobody knows the answers. When should a child have a smartphone? Is an iPad okay for a three-year-old? What are the good things to watch on these devices? Nobody really has the answers and yet parents have to decide what to do every minute of the day. So technology is testing parents. They're at the edge of their expertise, perhaps beyond it. And their trusted circle of support often fails them. And yet, you know, to go back to my kind of starting point, they're acutely aware that what they do in their everyday decisions today may have consequences for who their child will be and what chances they will have in the future. So the digital has become the terrain in which parents act. And I have to say, these were some of the most emotional interviews I've done in my, um, in my career. There were interviews in which parents cried. Uh, and it wasn't the digital simply that was generating those emotions, but it was what they were telling about and what, they were, what kind of struggles were revealed through talking about the digital. So Habiba Bikili, a low-income uh, single mother, said, look, I want them all to have their own future. I want them to be able to decide. My daughter, she says she wants to be a doctor. My son, he wants to be a teacher. So that's their hope. That's how you want them to make their own goal. Better children, better students, better for the future. And what does she do? Well, she gives them as much of the technologies to help them study and to help them choose for themselves. And that to many parents is precisely the thing they didn't have when they were starting out. Not only did they not have the technology, but they didn't have that freedom and that sense of possibilities to choose for themselves, because that choice is also part of the, the self-determination, the potential of the risk society. So mention of digital technology seems to catalyze the hopes and fears that parents have for their children now and in the future. 
And this is especially the case for the present generation of parents. Perhaps they're the last ones whose own childhoods were relatively technologically light, but certainly they are the ones and perhaps all future ones who will anticipate that their children's adulthood will be technologically intense. Cameron, a middle-class father of two said, look, there'll be jobs around now that won't be in 20 years. And I want to see my children embrace technology and work in something that's always developing and changing and you'll always be required, always needed. So that rhetoric that we hear from the politicians and economists about how the jobs of the future haven't even been invented yet is very top of mind for many parents. Mother of three, Aram said, I do recognize how important technology is now, you know, more than ever. I believe in human progress and how far we've come. And, you know, I came here from Eritrea for a better life and I'm absolutely determined to take advantage of it. I think life has changed for the best, even though there's a lot of negative stuff about technology. So Ar Ariam, like many, focuses on technologies because it symbolizes what it was she migrated for, what a better life looks like and what she can do to enroll her children in that life. And that raises a fourth reason, perhaps the most significant reason why the digital is so salient. If we think about what it means for someone to move from Eritrea to London and create her family life here. If we think about, you know, and notice how through her talk about technology, she's talking about the transformation she's made in her life. We can see how her talk about technology is weighted with all kinds of emotional significance that has much deeper roots than anything to do with technology. And we heard something very similar, though in a completely different vein, from the parents of the children with special educational needs and disabilities. Because here too, their talk was about technology um, and the kind of possible workaround it could provide the, for their children but the talk about technology was weighted with their anxieties and their frustrations about the failure of the system of society to support their child. So again, in talking about technology, they were really telling us about the deeper challenges they face, the values they're trying to live by, and the future they hope for. We also reflected, um, and I'm kind of coming towards my conclusion now, um, that the digital offers a kind of safe way uh, to express anxieties and seek, report, seek support. In our society, it seems perhaps safer to worry about technologies than to talk about and ask for help about the consequences of migration or the sense of loss that you've left your culture behind or how you feel about your marital breakdown or you know, the struggles of your uh, getting disability support for your child from, from the state. But everyone is ready to talk about screen time or what age to get a mobile phone. So everyone is kind of ready to engage in those conversations and through those conversations, we suggest parents are talking about much more. So the digital is salient because it symbolizes parents' hopes and fears for their child and it acts as a lightning rod for those deeper and broader problems, offering a kind of a solution or at least a workaround to the challenges parents face about migration, social mobility, economic insecurity, family tensions, and so on. And not only do parents focus their hopes and fears on the digital dimension of their child's um, activities because it's salient and seems to have this hope um, of a better life, but also navigating digital technology seems to open the way to addressing those other challenges. We can use technology to retain contact with dis distant family and one's culture of origin. We can gain digital expertise um, to enable um, uh, social mobility or perhaps get a good job. We can share media pleasures in ways to manage relationships that are otherwise under pressure. We can find online support and assistive technologies for children with disabilities. So I have all this in mind now when I kind of view parents' frustration about the child kind of lost in the screen, deaf to being called to dinner, throwing a tantrum when told to stop a video game. For it's not only the child's tantrum that's noteworthy, but also the parent's frustration. These are the moments when they feel the limits of their own power, not only to control their child in the here and now, but to bring about their child's future and to face the challenges that are important to them through the technology. 
But of course, parents also feel they're responsible for the digital technologies. They don't feel quite so responsible for economic insecurity or the structural challenges and changes in the country, but they do feel they made that decision to buy that iPad, to say yes to that computer game that's perhaps too old for their child. And so those decisions, again, as I said, make parents feel responsible and that heightens their anxieties, even though technology offers some practical steps. Okay, you want your child to learn how to become a coder, there's a coding club around the corner, you can enroll them and so on. So if I can um, come to a conclusion. When we, after listening to parents, um, we proposed what I've already signaled, which is kind of three uh, broad genres of parenting to kind of understand how parents are variously embracing technology, sometimes resisting technology, and often trying to find a balance um, with technology that fits their philosophy and their values. And this is one of the ways in which we try to challenge the idea that parents are a homogenous group. Not to say that parents fall into those three categories, but that they variously practice those genres according to their really diverse circumstances. And we also use that idea, particularly the parents who embrace technology, as a way of challenging the idea that they're the quote, digital immigrants who know nothing about technology. But more importantly, um, as I hope is now clear, we really wanted to challenge the idea that because parents talk about the digital so much, that's the real problem for them. So we unpack the ways in which they're using the digital to address the many other problems they're facing that I've um, discussed so far. And listening to parents um, reveals some of the kind of particular struggles of the risk society, because parents are caught in this pincer movement. They're simultaneously burdened with more responsibilities, and yet they're also tasked with um, respecting the agency of their child. And um, Anthony Giddens has written about the idea of today's democratic family. I think today's democratic family, which many parents um, are supportive of, results in that endless process of negotiation that exhausts parents. Um, and as I've argued, often is occurring about the digital technologies, even though it's also about something else. Because those days, you know, parents often remember the childhood in which they could, um, uh, the, the parent's will would be imposed on the child, the parent could say, I told you so, you do it because I said so. Uh, those days have gone exactly what replaces them and how um, it replaces them uh, results in these kind of endlessly mundane um, arguments and negotiations, often about what to watch, how long for and why. So we end the book um, and um, we might want to discuss in the, in the Q&A with some of the recommendations, not so much to parents as to the agencies that shape parents' lives and that could do a much better job um, in supporting them and indeed in hearing their voices and understanding them. So whether it's schools or welfare organisations or digital providers or actually the mass media, um, we try to kind of end by um, capturing something of what parents said that, that could be changed, that could make a difference. Because so often, um, and in, in, in lots of my work, I kind of spend my time with those stakeholders, with those other groups, trying to bring the, the evidence and the research to them. So often I hear assumptions made about parents in their absence, complaining about parents, expressing implicitly, if not intentionally, this kind of deficit view of parents as failing and making their own problems. Um, and it's remarkable rare, remarkably rare that parents do get heard. So um, parents, I might end, are also people. Um, and in relation to the digital world, uh, we try to give them a voice. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>